I mean, the first part of the book is a driving trip, and in that case, I'm meeting people for shorter periods of time. And really, one thing that, that helped was I was driving, and I had an empty passenger seat, and so I was picking up people on the road who were hitchhiking. I hadn't really planned on this, because I hadn't thought about who was hitchhiking in China until I found myself behind the wheel. Many of these people were young folks leaving villages, looking for jobs in factories and cities. You know, when you're giving somebody a ride, they're going to talk to you, and, and I'm a little different for them. I'm a foreigner. They're interested in that as well. Explain the process of getting a driver's license in China. Well, as a foreigner, it's actually a lot easier than as a Chinese. The Chinese, Chinese have to take a, you know, an incredibly long written exam. They actually have to do like more than 50 hours of training that they pay for. It's pretty expensive by Chinese standards. And then they have to take an incredibly elaborate two-day driving exam, which really has no useful skills, but things that are very dif technically difficult. As a foreigner, when I took it, you didn't have a written exam, and all you had to do was a driving exam, um, and that involved, I got in a car with a guy who was smoking a cigarette. He was smoking the, the uh, Red Pagoda Mountain, which That's are right. a very, very common sort of middle-class cigarette in Beijing. Um, and he said, start the car, drive. I drove for like, you know, half a block, and he said, great. That's it. And I, that was it. There were no turns. There wasn't any parking. It was really just a formality. Yeah, no, it's a very intense experience there to drive. You have to be very alert, very aware. But in a way, it's, you know, it's exciting and certainly interesting. And it gave me a different perspective and a different sense of freedom as a writer and as a reporter. But, but you didn't just drive as someone getting in a car from going to A to B. You decided to track the Great Wall of China, which as you, you talk about the maps and how there's a funny squiggle of little turrets. Yeah. The maps of China are a story in themselves. I mean, actually, in China, you cannot buy, for example, a good topographical map because that's classified. That's considered a state secret. So there seems to be a, a degree of designed um, inaccuracy in all the maps because the government is afraid of it, basically. And they haven't had to deal with a situation in the past where lots of people were driving and moving on their own. So it's a very new thing for them. So maps are hard. And also, you have a place where things are being built so fast. I went and talked to the biggest bat map baker in Beijing, and they told me that they had to update their city maps every three months because of how quickly neighborhoods and streets are changed. You realize that things are being built very quickly. Um, neighborhoods, villages, towns are changing radically, and people's lives and their, and their perspectives are also changing. So that's, that's what put me on the road. And really, I mean, a lot of the book is also about how places, specific places, respond when new roads are built. And how people and their lives change. Yeah, you know, and I think actually it was... It was so unusual in some of these places that they didn't really register what I was. I mean, I'd, sometimes I would pick people up and they would ask me if I was Mongolian or if I was a Uyghur or something. And people other. often asked you if you were Chinese. Yeah, they did sometimes. I had a number of people ask me if I were Chinese. That had never happened to me anywhere else. And that's just because I was driving and they found, you know, they, they couldn't figure out how this, you know, it's, it's very unusual for them to see a foreigner in the first place, but to see one driving was even more so. Generally, you find that the, the ethnic minorities in China are probably going to be more positive about foreigners just because they're often, these ones that are politically charged, like the Uyghurs and the Tibetans, they tend to be, you know, sort of anti-Chinese to a degree. And so they kind of will look at any foreigner because as being an alternative. Being the Uyghurs are the Muslim, the, the, the Muslim minority that, you know, that, that, that has been persecuted in the far west and the Tibetans, you know, are, Tibet is yeah. Long history. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it is a complicated place. That's one reason why driving across the west of China is a little tricky because if you go, I, a couple of times I went through those areas and things are obviously more tense and they, they are monitored more closely. You went to China first of all with the Peace Corps. I, I joined the Peace Corps in 1996 and I was part of the third group of volunteers to be sent to China. You know, went to Fuling? Yeah, Fuling, which is a very small city. At that time, it was in Sichuan province. It's on the Yangtze River in the Three Gorges region. And, and Fuling was a town that had not had American residents for basically half a century. And, you know, so that was a really intense introduction to the country. It was me and another volunteer. And, you know, we were the only foreigners living in that city. Um, and we didn't speak Chinese very well when we arrived. The Peace Corps gave us two months of very intensive training once we arrived. But, but two months, if that's what you're doing, you know, four hours a day and then studying on your own, um, you can, by the end of those two months, we could do the basics. You could get around, get directions. Yeah, so, I, you know, I had a Chinese name, and, but most of, the, most of what you learn, you have to learn on your own. Um, and it's, but it's very hard for at the beginning. The first six months were incredibly difficult, um, partly because of the attention. If we go anywhere in town, there'd be a crowd of 20 or 30 people staring at us, which, you know, 
it's sort of funny and entertaining for a day, but it, when, when that's your daily life, it's very wearing. Did they come know? and touch your nose? They love eyes. to rub my, you know, my arms because I have hair, which, which, which most Chinese don't, don't have hairy arms. After a point, you, know, you, you often just want to sort of blend in and, and have less attention, but you, you have to learn to deal with it. And at the same time, you're trying to learn the language. And after about six months, I could feel myself starting to get a better sense of the language. And after a year, I, I had reached a comfort level. And really, the second year in the Peace Corps was, was, was very enjoyable because I felt comfortable. And all that time, you were teaching English. We were there because China was opening up. And basically, this is a country where studying English would have been politically suspect in the 60s and 70s during the Cultural Revolution. Revolution. Yeah. But, you know, Deng Xiaoping came to power, and then in 1978, he started this reform and opening period where he wanted the economy to open up, but he also wanted China to be more open to the outside world, and part of that is, is language. And so they had begun to make English compulsory in all middle schools, and now it's in compulsory in elementary schools, but they needed teachers. And so our job was to train young Chinese people, college students, who would become teachers in middle schools, basically, in the countryside. So, you know, it's... In, in a way, was a very inspiring thing to be a part of because this is a country that had been very isolated and, and basically xenophobic, um, but they were trying to take a different approach to the world. You kept a very methodical diary, I imagine, and notes and everything, and then you went back to the States and you sent it to agents and they ran with it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, hadn't, I had not arrived in China wanting to write a book. I didn't think that would be possible. I did want to be a writer. I've always wanted that since I was a high school student. But I was very young when I joined the Peace Corps, 27, pretty young for a writer. My goal was to learn Chinese, to learn something about China, and then I hoped that later I'd be able to write about the place. So after I came back from the Peace Corps, I went home to my parents' home, Columbia, Missouri, and spent four months writing a draft of River Towns it, it, without any contact with agents and publishers, which is probably a very good thing. It just I just focused on the writing. I didn't care if it was going to get published. I, my, my goal was just to record this experience. And then you decided you had to go back to China and be a writer. I, you know, actually, that decision was sort of made for me because while I was working on Rivertown, I had this idea I'd come back to the States, get a journalism job, and then get sent back to China as a correspondent. I didn't want to, to have to do it on my own because it was just a little intimidating to go back and, and without any sort of you know, salary insurance and be a freelance writer. Um, but I couldn't find a job in the States, basically. I, one thing I realized is that in you know, journalism, it's quite hard to come in from the outside often. And I had been in the Peace Corps for two years, and even though I had published a lot of freelance stuff... For very good publications. Yeah, no, I, I'd written for good publications. Atlantic Monthly. Yeah, and I'd written New York Times. articles for the New York Times. But, you know, I had not worked for anybody, and without job experience, nobody was willing to, to, to take a look at me. And so... I decided, well, if I want to do this, I've just got to go back and do it on my own. That turned out to be the best thing. I finished Rivertown in uh, 98, very end of 98, and I sold at the beginning of 99. That's when I made the decision to go back. And having the book accepted kind of gave me that final push to go. It gave me enough security. I felt like, for one thing, they paid me in advance that covered my college loans that I still had outstanding. But then it also made me think, okay, there's, there's a future here. You know, I can, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was basically the encouragement that mattered. And I said, okay, you know, if I was able to publish this book, I should be able to publish other things. And, and, you know, and from there, I, you know, I just went back to Beijing and figured it out. So then Oracle Bones came after that, which is an extraordinary book, which was very well received. I like to write a book before I get a contract, basically, because I, I sort of like to do the thing on my own terms, with my own pace. I don't want to schedule from somebody else. And so after Rivertown, I said, well, I'm going to work on my magazine freelancing career, and I'll see what turns out. And I wait until a book project, you know, starts to take shape. And the new book, Country Driving, is really about economics and, and development specifically. So, you know, my goal as a writer has been to shift my focus a little bit. Um, but over the course of it, these three books covered the decade from 96 to about 2007. In Country Driving, I don't at any point feel that you're a foreigner driving as a foreigner mm. being critical. This is a one-on-one -on -one human relationship without being too soapy about it. Uh, one thing that happened is probably from being in the Peace Corps where I had a very intense relationship with a place and a small group of people, my students, my friends, my coworkers. Um, it kind of made it more manageable. So I sort of, I think as a writer in China, I never had the sense that I am writing about China. I'm, I'm finding people that interest me or places that interest me or subjects that engage me, and I'm trying to understand these, these very specific parts of a big country. So I tried not to be burdened by that. You know, what is China? What am I, what am, how am I portraying China? So you're not being political? No, no, I, 
my instincts have never been very political. I mean, a lot of these stories have a very political dimension. I'm describing the impact of politics on people's, on people's lives, but I'm not interested in you know, shaping policy toward China or, or giving people prescriptions on, on how they need to perceive this place. I'm, my interest is always descriptive. It's not prescriptive. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm trying to describe what this place is like and I'm trying to describe what people are like and what motivates them. Which is interesting. You said that it's not coming out in the mainland yet. Is it little incidents that they want excised or is it the entire attitude they don't want this foreigner running no, around I making mean, judgments? The books, I mean, Oracle Bones is trickier than the other two probably but you know, Rivertown is probably 97% kosher. If they were going to, but they, there are small things that they would have to remove in any of these books. If you refer to the Tiananmen Square massacre or the Tibet problem or the Uyghur problem, all these things would get removed. Or even Genghis Khan. They might change it, you know. And it's like, as a writer, I don't feel comfortable with that. It's it's frustrating because I do. I think there's a problem when you're writing about people and they can't read it, you know, and, and I, when I've written articles, I wrote a couple of magazine articles about the family that's in this book and they were translated and I gave them copies of it and so, you know, they can read when I'm, when I'm writing. I've been offered contracts, but they always would require things to be changed and as a writer, I don't feel good about, I, I won't sign my name to that. I just don't believe that, that a writer should agree to have something politically excised, you know, and I think having having grown up in a country where that doesn't happen, I'm not willing to make that compromise, you know. What would you like businessmen to know? What is it they don't know? The chain has become so efficient. I mean, when people in China produce something, there is, for example, there's a town near, near the, in, in Zhejiang province called Yiwu, which is where everything is sold in bulk. And if you're a foreign buyer, you go to Yiwu, and you go to that town, and they have this incredible mall that where you can buy anything you want in, you know, in huge volume. And so you don't actually have to go to the factory and meet the people that do it. There is a, a, you know, an insulation. I mean, in some ways, we're very connected with these folks, very direct. I mean, our economy impacts them, their economy impacts us. You know, there isn't the direct contact. And that's, I mean, that's what I think is the purpose of writing. You know, was one thing that I, one reason I have faith in writing is because I think it's a way to introduce this to people. Um, I, it's also why I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm impressed that so many Americans are studying Chinese. That's very important. And I'm impressed that so many Chinese are studying English. So this is, it, you know, it, it happens in other ways. The market doesn't take care of it, though. You realize that. It's not, you know, Boss Gao and Boss Wang do not need to speak English to do what they're doing. And the American buyer does not need to go there and, and shake their hands. You know, and, and so that connection has to come from a different impulse. And I, I think it does come from, from books, from, from, from movies, you know, from, from news reports, from radio, from all, this, all these ways that we report on China. And it also comes from people studying, studying language both in China and here. All your cars you're driving around in are foreign. <laughs> and they're made there, but what about domestic Chinese Yeah, cars? yeah, well this is because I started this project in 2001 Pretty much most of the cars you were going to have were, were going to be like a Volkswagen. They're made in China. Those joint ventures were very profitable. For example, GM, which of course is, is having huge struggles in America, they make profits in China. Um, and, and that was true for many years with both VW and GM, that they had a huge percentage of their global profits were coming from China. But now the Chinese car companies are coming up. And I, in the book, I'd write about one of them, Cherry, which is one of the early companies. And they've, they sort of pioneered, in a sense, these very cheap, small cars that worked for Chinese consumers. And, and that's becoming more and more of a factor now in China. The foreign companies still do quite well, but Chinese companies are, are rising up. And, and there's also a lot of talk about the Chinese getting into the electric car market because they have a high incentive to do that. This is Claudia Craig, and I'm talking here with Peter Hessler. His latest book is Country Driving, which follows on from Rivertown and Oracle Bones. Tell us about the family in the book, their lives. You know, I, I started renting a house north of Beijing in 2001, and really, I mean, my interest there was much more personal than professional, and I wasn't looking for a place to write about. I was looking for a place where I could escape the city a little bit, and, but I did want to have a different relationship with people. I realized that Beijing was so overwhelming. I wanted a place that's a little easier for me to get to know people and to get a sense of, of, of this place. Um, and as time developed, I became very close with, with a family that my neighbors, and, you know, I, I guess our relationship sort of changed when, they, when their son became very ill, Wei Jia, and he became very sick and he had a life-threatening illness, basically, and we, and we had a, a very stressful two weeks of trying to get him medical care. And I was working with the parents and to try to get him in a good hospital. And China has a health care problem. The difference is, is that China's problem is, 
is basically 100% financial, you know, in the sense they have such a huge population, they have never insured everybody. It's, it's a problematic system, and they've, they've talked a lot about reforming it, and they're also having a lot of trouble doing that. So um, you saw that problem on the ground with this boy? Yeah, and this was, I mean, I wasn't writing about them. I was just renting the place in the village and became very involved in that. And it, it changed my relationship with the family and with the village um, in the sense that I, there was just a different, you know, different closeness after that. I gained a lot of respect for the parents. They were amazingly calm and rational and easy, you know, very pragmatic during that situation, and, and they were very appreciative. I mean, I felt frustrated because sometimes I couldn't do the things I would do if I were in America. You know, it made me feel like a foreigner sometimes because you're coming up against the system, um, in, in, you know, in ways that are frustrating. But they were very patient and, you know, very, they're very tough people. That's the way a lot of people are in China. It's interesting, the whole bra rings factory. In the third section of three is a section about a small city in, in southeastern China. Li Shui is, you know, and this is sort of a small factory town, but this region is famous for producing all kinds of stuff that comes to America and other countries. And, you know, I was interested in following development in this town, and I happened to meet some entrepreneurs while they were designing their factory. I watched them design this this, you know, workspace, sort of amazing. I saw them put in the, you know, the new equipment and all this stuff. And then they hadn't talked much about the, the product. And so finally we reached a point where we're talking about well, what are you producing here? And, and it was, it turned out it was a little, they are the rings that connect with the straps of a brassiere. And this is the, this is the main product of this factory. And, and, and it's, you know, you look at this and it's sort of ridiculous because it's such a tiny object that we would never think about. But these two entrepreneurs have invested their life savings. They've hired, you know, a dozen workers who have also left their homes to find jobs. I mean, you have, it is true that almost any little object you have that you are buying that is somehow connected to China, that object represents a world for somebody. Maybe it's that focus. Mm -hmm that the developed world has lost. Yeah, I mean, most of us are very insulated from, you know, from, from this level of, of detail and this level of production. Um, but, you know, when you're there and you're following these people, you do realize how much is invested in this. I mean, it's and that little object was, you know, it's a world of ambition and competition and, you know, people's dreams and, you know, you know lots, lots depends on this. And the entrepreneurship, I think people believe that is only an American quality. Mm. Even the small businesses you come across, people in the street, mm. is this innate entrepreneurship. Yeah, the people are very hungry. I mean, that, that, that's a lot of it. I mean, this is a country where people did not have a lot of freedom over their life decisions in the past. They couldn't live wherever they wanted. They, their jobs were government assigned, and all of that has changed since 1978. And Chinese people do not have political freedom as we envision it. They can't start an independent union. They can't vote for an opposition party. They can't publish whatever they want. But they have a huge amount of lifestyle freedom in the sense that they can live where they want now. They can move. They're very mobile. And they can find their own jobs and find their own ways to produce things. And they are incredibly good at that. And, and some of it is just this drive because they appreciate the opportunity. They didn't have it in the past. There's a sense that all this energy was pent up. And this generation, we're seeing it the character I'm most uh, impressed by is the girl who changes her ID. Mm -hmm. The Tal sisters. We follow her all yeah. the way through. What about the women in your book? I mean, they're not just the women in your book. They're people you happen to come across who happen to be women. I said it on this job interview... Um, where the boss was interviewing a young woman and he had already filled up all of the, all of his positions. Sorry, you know, I can't give you a job, but I'll take your name. And if there's a spot on the waiting list, and she said, no, I want to be on the list. And he said, well, that's not how things are done. We've had a list. This is the second day. You didn't show up on the first day. And But she just refused to accept this, you know, and she sat there for 15 minutes. And she's like, no, it's a very simple situation. All you have to do is put me on the list, take somebody's name off the list. And he's like, that's ridiculous. And this guy's in his 50s. And this is a, you know, young woman who said she was you know, 17. And, and finally, I mean, just by sheer force of will, she gets him to do it, you know, and that's, that was his response afterwards. I was sitting in the room and he, he turned to me and he said, wow, that, that woman knows how to get things done. And later we realized that she was using her sister, older sister's ID. And she wasn't even the person she claimed to be. She was actually barely even 15 years old, totally illegal. She did it and she got the job and she became a very effective worker. And she was able, you know, her and family. You knew her over a period of About almost two years. So I got to know the family very well. And they were all, they were amazing. But you do see 
you look at the outside of that situation, like, okay, this is a 15-year-old woman who's working on an assembly line, and she's getting paid by the piece. I mean, she's making the little, the, you know, the pieces that go in the inside of a brassiere, the support structure, and for every two of those, she makes a 20th of an American penny. Yeah, getting, I think it's 40 cents an hour when yeah. we first learn about 40, the wage. 40 cents is the minimum wage in that town, which is not a bad wage, you know, in terms of buying power there. She was making less than that because she's doing piecework, and she only makes... You know, for every two of these wires that she produces, she makes a twentieth of a cent. And she's very slow at the start, but she becomes very fast. And eventually she's making double the minimum wage, you know, in that job. So this is a situation, it's very hard as an outsider to wrap your head around it. Because, okay, this is a 15-year-old who's, who's making, you know, in the beginning, 30 cents an hour. It seems to us like a clear case of victimization. But if you, as I followed this person over time, I realized how incredibly capable she was. And she was also, her and her family were capable of, you know, negotiating with these bosses in a really hard, a really tough way. They were able to get what they wanted. Do you keep in touch with all these people? Oh, yeah. It's very hard in China because what happens is it, people like this, they move so often and they change their phones all the time because there's always some new plan that's a little cheaper in their switch. So that family I am currently trying to track down. But I hear from, for example, Master Lo, the man in the factory that I often talk to, He's, he's a little more stable, and I've been able to keep track of him. And, of course, the family in the village, I talk to them all the time because they're in the same place. Well, you're part of their family now. Yeah, and they're, they're, in, a, they're in a single place. The people that are very hard to track down are migrants. You know, my, my wife, Leslie Chang, is a writer, and she did a book about migrants. And what she often would do would be buy them a phone. And, and sometimes she realized, I have to give these people a phone that, and make them promise that they will keep this stable. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just lose touch with them. It's, it's, it's a really fluid society. But, but people, you know, along the way, these young women are changing jobs. I mean, one of the girls she worked with was 16 and already had three different assembly line jobs. I mean, they are learning a lot. You mentioned right at the beginning of the interview, 145 million migrants. And you talk about how these migrants and these girls and these people who take these different jobs are the strength of China. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's important to realize when, when we talk about this migration, these are not people that are being starved out of villages. I mean, this is often our perceptions when we think of migrants or people from the countryside going to the cities. You think of them fleeing, basically, but, you know, sociologists will talk about push factors and pull factors. And this is a, this is a case in China where the pull factors, which means the incentives, that's what's drawing them. To the, to the cities. They are not being starved out of the villages. So they are leaving basically on their own accord, and they are leaving because they believe they have a better life elsewhere. And then that's a very important element because Which it shows... So far they it have. gives Yeah, because I think they feel like they have agency. By our perspectives, they do not because they do not have unions. They do not have, you know, a legal system that really protects them the way it should. Um, so from our perspective, you know, they might seem sort of helpless if we look at them from the wrong angle. But from their perspective, their decisions matter. They you really talk believe about this. how they handle the financial crisis. That's also mm. a theme that comes up. What do they believe will happen when this growth stops? They are going to run up against a wall, aren't they? Well, everybody's been saying that it hasn't happened yet. And the financial crisis, I mean, it did not affect China the way people thought. And, you know, one thing that did not surprise me at all was that, uh, you know, people lost their jobs and they responded in a very rational, pragmatic way. Basically, they might go back to the village, they waited for a few months. Once they heard things were picking up again in the factories, they went back. People in China have been through a lot of ups and downs, and something like the financial crisis, they will take in stride. I mean, I think that is one big advantage they have. Whereas to Americans, I mean, we're used to having a pretty, you know, pretty much straight, stable prosperity. And when something like that happens, I feel like people get much more disoriented than they would in China. One of the saddest aspects of the book uh, is the death of the hutong, the old... From the book, I get the impression it's just one of this great advancement and road towards prosperity. There is a loss. I mean, certainly these old neighborhoods and old parts of cities and are, are being lost. Villages are dying. I mean, I, when I drove across the north, you go through these villages where there's almost no young people because they're all going to the factory towns in the southeast. But, you know, there isn't a lot of nostalgia in China. And I think when a society is changing at this pace and when people are coping with so many new challenges and so many transitions, I don't think they have a lot of energy to expend on it. They're, so this particular moment, this particular generation, is not very nostalgic. And you don't hear a lot of people talking about the good old days in that sense. Some of the older people do, but certainly none of the sort of middle-aged or younger people. Um, people are very much focused on today, you know. That's really, they aren't thinking very hard and uh, very far ahead either. Well, Peter Hessler, thank you very much indeed. His latest book is Country Driving from HarperCollins. Thank you.